welcome. I'm Monique, and this is the True Worth podcast. Today, my guest is Michael Donovan, and I've known Michael for many, many years. Um, he is the founding director of Edgeware Creative Entrepreneurship, which is a small business training and coaching company. And he also maintains his own coaching practice. And I've been lucky enough to have coaching from Michael um, at a number of times over the past decade or so, which has been fantastic. Um, Michael has a background in community cultural development, especially cross-cultural work, which inspired innovation in business design, higher education and vocational education and training. He was recently executive in residence at the Unis Centre at Griffith University, which had a focus on social enterprise and entrepreneurship development. Prior to that, he was innovator in residence at Comlink Australia, working on a community of practice, developing novel pro products and services in health and wellbeing. So welcome, Michael. Lovely to have you here today. Lovely to be here, Monique. Lovely to continue the conversation. I feel like it just happens in instalments. <laughs> it does. We just pick up where we left off. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is fantastic. Um, and the last time uh, we caught up and, and had a lovely dinner and you were talking um, then quite excitedly, I observed, um, about this um, concept of eldragogy and how we continue to learn uh, throughout our lives and, and especially into our later years. So I thought that it would be really interesting to have a chat about that today. Um, it's a focus around the true worth of elders. Um, I think it can be the case that we, uh, we underestimate, um, you know, what uh, older people can bring um, to the community and to our society. They tend to be a bit discarded sometimes, which is quite um, unfortunate. Um, so maybe if I can just uh, start by asking you, I mean, who is an elder? Is there some calendar date whereby you suddenly become an elder or um, mm -hmm. is there some other way we define this? And, and these days, like a lot of these things, I think we could find sort of cultural layers that make meaning of the, the concept of elderhood. But at base, um, it's extraordinary. I think there's an evolutionary driver and it's worth going back right to the beginning of that. As far as we know, we're the only mammals that live beyond our period of sexual viability. viability. Um, everything else, every, every other animal, the great apes, the, 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 the other higher mammals or more sophisticated mammals die off pretty much soon after they've um, reproduced, which makes sense in terms of purely materialistic evolution. Um, they need to make way for the next generation and so on. So what is the evolutionary value of having another set of hands? And there's research that shows that um, it may be indirect selection rather than direct or sexual selection as, as in classical evolution, uh, where we've shown that in modern hunter-gatherer societies, those who are closer to where we're actually from, where our roots are, um, those groups which have grandmothers um, have children that, that live longer um, or have children that survive into adulthood. Yeah. So it seems that there is, um, and thus, as I say, indirect selection, there's an advantage to us. So I think there's probably also, a, you know, people use the word epigenetic value in um, actually maintaining for a highly social animal like us, um, maintaining um, corporate memory for more than one generation on, on the hoof, as it were. Not just don't eat the red berries, not just mm -hmm. the one in a hundred year storm when the starlings do this, uh, that sort of um, inherited knowledge, but what I would call wisdom, yeah. um, which is insight into the meaning of the tribe, of the group. Um, I think there's a reason that we tend to associate wisdom with elderhood. Um, even when we say, you know, such and such a precocious young child or whatever is wise, we're talking about wise beyond her years. We're mapping her to elderhood. Um, and I think that bespeaks a, pash, a, pa, uh, 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 a meaning for this so-called third act or um, the, the final third of, of your life, which is coming into focus again as we age, as, yeah. you know, the 100-year life, people are now throwing around phrases like the 60-year career um, yeah. and et cetera. Like in industrial terms, we 
we're required to re retire, so to speak, is a word I hate. Yes. At 60, 65, whatever it is, you know, this arbitrary number is put on it. And it is an arbitrary number. Yeah. Um, uh, such that, you know, it's considered that after that point, you're no longer productive. Um, and in fact, you become an, a, a deficit. You, you become a cost to society, a highly medicalized cost. As the yeah. fact is, you know, by now, if we retire in the conventional sense at 60, um, men are living um, into their 80s now, women even longer. So you could be living up to another third of your life beyond this so-called retirement period. Yes. Um, yes. So there's an industrial construction of elderhood of, in, in that sense. And mm. I think the, the other thing that's worth mentioning is ageism. Um, yeah. As I get older myself, I, exper I experience this. And there is uh, there are out of America, of course, um, ageist um, ageism activists, activists who are pointing to this, which... You know, unlike all the other is isms, you know, sort of um, sexism, racism, ableism, and so on, it's the one that applies to all of us. Sure, yeah. If we're <laughs> we, lucky we enough to all live experience enough, this, right? yeah. and whether it's formally or informally put, um, those yeah. of us who get older, and I, I suspect particularly women, will experience um, subtly or perhaps explicitly yes. um, prejudice against them as they because of their age and nothing else. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and so there, there can be a lot of, um, I guess, negativity around this then. And as you say, I mean, um, it's a big shift in our human society that, you know, in the past century, the, the life expectancy has more than doubled. So where 100 mm. years ago, someone wouldn't have expected to live much beyond 40. But now, as you say, we can realistically expect to live to 100, quite a few of us. So um, it's a big shift in, in this sort of idea of, well, what do we do in that um, third stage of life, um, mm. as you put it? Um, what are some of the reasons you, you think it might be that um, people are underestimated that, at that stage of life? I think it's an artifact, it's, and, and it's fairly recent historically, it's an artifact of um, the Industrial Revolution and modernism, where um, life is sliced into three slices, basically. There's the educational slice, where you're learning to be a citizen and do a job. There's the period where you're doing a job, and then there's retirement and death. You know, life doesn't work like that anymore. We talk about lifelong learning. We talk about uh, portfolio careers. Uh, people are shifting. Professionals are shifting three or four times already in their lives. Uh, we talk about the gig economy. That that slice and dice uh, approach to life just doesn't work anymore. Um, so the, the the idea of adolescence similarly is a very recent concept. You know, it, it didn't exist once. <laughs> So, you know, um, as you say, the, the end of the war, the average life, uh, the, the, the men were dying at about 68, which makes sort of 65 as a retirement age sensible yeah. in a way, yeah. uh, whereas now they're living into their 80s. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that kind of um, industrial construction of work creates the older person as, super <coughs> pardon me, as superfluous, as not productive, yes. and that is superseded. Yes. And it's something that's superseding very quickly, um, historically speaking. It's something we need to adapt to very, um, very um, in a very agile way, I think. Yeah. So how could we do better at this? So how could we better serve our elders so that we all have the benefit of, of their lived experience and their wisdom? I think your word, assets, you know, I mean, is, is, when we see this cohort as through an asset lens rather than a deficit lens, when we say we see this cohort as having extraordinary experience of life, of having travelled, of having read, of having experienced family, um, all sorts of trouble and recovery from trouble and so on, if we see those as social assets um, in a world where we're either offshoring a lot of production to the developing world or automating production onshore, we are increasingly valuing um, so-called 21st century skills, generic skills, you know, these things that we're talking about that, that are uniquely human, our capacity to communicate, our capacity to work in teams, our capacity to innovate, our capacity to lead. These are things that the we can't offshore to yes. China and that we can't automate as far so far. Um, 
the the only while while getting older does in, in, in inevitably involve a certain amount of decline physically mm -hmm. decline there are other attributes among elders that actually increase and are, there are, and you're at your peak at that point and the one that i'm fascinated with when it comes to the idea of wisdom is metacognition we right. we become better at seeing the forest for the trees as we yes. get older, and I think there's something about that in the value of elders. You know, looking at it from a broader perspective, looking at it from the helicopter, what yes. do you see in the way of trends and etc. Mm -hmm. I think we just haven't learned. The rest of us haven't learned how to properly engage those assets. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's something there too around this shift from historically the value of um, producing physical goods and um, you know tangible things having value towards what we've seen very much over the recent couple of decades which is that now the world's most valuable companies are primarily have intangible assets and the majority of the growth is there so um, as you say we might have physical decline we might not be able to lay bricks or you know um, shift pallets of wood the same as mm. we might have when we're younger but mm. that's not where the value lies anymore that's um, that in fact this wisdom of, of, be, of being able to see ideas um, you know create value from ideas um, that we in fact may do much better because we've yeah. had more life experience and we're less focused on you know I, I think our sense of time is different isn't it when you've yeah. seen a pattern I even know now and I'm not even 50 I can see patterns over my lifetime, uh, you know, that I can observe now and say, oh, yes, I've seen this all before. Um, right. I'm sure once you're 80, it's even more so. Um, well, yes. take a scenario where I offer you 20 more years of life, okay? Here it is on a, on a platter. You can live 20 more years. Now, the thing is you need to insert those 20 anywhere you can, anywhere you want in your life, you know, so 10 ages, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40 or whatever. Now, if you're asked that question when you're 20 years old, it is entirely meaningless. Yes. Because you've only had 20 years so yes, far. Yes, yes. It's only when you're 80 that you can say, oh, that decade from my 30s to my 40s, I could do something better then, you know. Yes. Yeah. It's only when you're 80 that you have the capacity to have that overview. Yeah, yeah, it's a different perspective, isn't it? Um, so how do our learning needs change um, across our lifetime? Because, of course, when we're in school, there's this concept of pedagogy, teaching children, yeah. and, um, andragogy, adults, and you're, you're talking about um, eldergogy. So, so how does this change over our lifetime? Well, the, I suppose the inspiration for me was that notion of andragogy, which actually is very old. It can go back to Comenius, the Czech educator from the 13th century, I think, that um, in modern terms, uh, an educator called Malcolm Knowles um, coined the phrase to indicate that um, what the learner brings and what the learner expects from the educational experience as an adult differs from that of a child. Mm -hmm. Um, the way I think of it very roughly is that pedagogy, the education of children, has to do with the formation, with formation, with the development of citizen skills, citizenship, um, capacity to operate in the world, read, write, function, um, communicate, etc. So there's, a, there's fairly baseline skills and there's a fairly strong role for didactic learning, just straight knowledge, knowledge transfer in that context. As an adult, if we go into, say, you know, postgraduate level training or vocational training, that sort of thing, it's less about um, didactic delivery of knowledge um, uh, exchange and knowledge exchange and more towards professional development and um, gearing up better for the workforce or being able to change careers or whatever. Towards the end of the life, towards the, the last third of life, these things become less important. Um, and it might be a little bit presumptuous to talk about a school of education called eldragogy that's appropriate for this age group, but the fact is we observe uh, a more integrative and reflective uh, mindset. So the learner is bringing um, expectations to the educational experience that have to do with making sense of yeah. all of this, you know? So it's not about making money, it's not about making or formation of character, etc. It's about making sense of what this thing called my life was. Well, I think we, that's a natural thing. That's how wisdom arises 
in in the first place. So as an educator, I, I'm interested in what, what a curriculum for that might look like. Is a curriculum something even worth discussing at this point? And I think it is still possible to do that. It's still possible to engage with I think it's an opportunity. I think it's an educational horizon for us to, as a society, engage more productively with this extraordinarily wasted um, school of uh, opportunity that we're currently just dismissing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a real wealth of um, knowledge and wisdom and experience to uh, potentially tap into there, isn't there? Um, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, and, and so what are some of the things you think we need to consider? Uh, you know, we're all ageing every day, aren't we? So what do we need to consider as we approach this stage of life ourselves and our own journey from perhaps that middle age stage um, into elderhood? They, there, there's, a, there's a rethinking or a re-examination of some of the 60s, 70s humanist psychologists, um, Dewey, particularly Maslow, at the moment, and you know, Maslow never drew a pyramid. I mean, there, there was a hierarchy um, that we know about, of course, starting with food and shelter at the bottom. It's often thought that the the peak of the pyramid, as so, so to speak, was is self actualization. That the business of progressing in life is to actualize oneself, to become the best version of oneself that's possible. But there's evidence now that Maslow, who was famously messy and had bits and pieces of work all over the place was working on a stage beyond self-actualization, which he called self-transcendence. Um, and this is kind of consistent with a lot of the Buddhist narrative where um, a life of serve, you, you, one is actualized through service to others rather than um, the realization of internal capacity, mm. um, where the psychologized individual becomes less important and effective response and service to the world becomes mm -hmm. more important. Um, so this is the bodhisattva ideal for yeah. people who, who want that. And it's consistent with, you know, anecdotal experience of, you know, so aging billionaires who realize yeah. at some stage of their life that they're, they're not gonna take it with them. You know, right. sunsets as Bill Ga Gates told us, do not scale. No, <laughs> it will always be the same sunset, no matter yeah. how much money you've got in your pocket. Yeah. So if that's the case, if sunsets don't scale, then we need to understand how we're appreciating that sunset and how it helps us become better, better people in response to that. So for sunset, read, service to community, yeah. making meaning by giving back. Bill Gates is trying to eradicate malaria, you know, yeah. um, and I think that's wonderful. I think it's a pity that he drove hundreds of businesses to the wall in this yeah. journey to, yeah. to that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Some of what I've read about this rethinking of Maslow is actually that more recent research shows that, um, in fact, the need for social connection for us as human beings is more fundamental than food or shelter. Um, and that, in fact, without that, we we may as well not bother with the next well, you put us, you, you isolate us from other human beings, we go crazy. Yeah. Very quickly, very quickly. And in fact, I think there's a case for arguing that, you know, again, this I am a rock, I am an island, the psychologized individual self that has his or her own journey to, 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 to undertake is an illusion that we are actually social creatures. And it's certainly my view that the, the East has more to teach us about this than Western mechanized um, post-industrial thinking. A more reductionist approach that we tend to have. It, it's not tenable over, over the long term. And I think that's starting to um, starting to occur to us as the, yeah. you know, the Reaganite, Thatcherite, um, neoliberal promise turns out to be fake. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking around, if, if, if it's not about, you know, trickle down, if it's not about self and self-interest enlightened or not, what is it about? And part of the answer to that, I think, is social responsibility yeah. and yeah. good for the others. So to the extent that I can be good for you, I will feel good about myself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think there's more focus on this now, too, when we start to be very serious about 
um, sustainability or we feel this threat that if we aren't thinking about how things are interconnected rather than just this extractive approach to you know withdrawing what we think we need that can't be replaced um, then I think that helps us to change that perspective too doesn't it indeed indeed so I'd love to, um, if you're happy to share from your own experience, um, are there times in your life that, you know, in particular you recall where you feel you yourself have been underestimated? Um, and how do you respond in those situations? I, I think I've lived a whole life of being underestimated. It doesn't have to do with, it, it has to do my, with my theory of weirdness, you know. I, <laughs> right, I, yes, I, yes. I, I am a weirdo. I, yes. um, a friend of mine, an evolutionary psychologist, as it happens, talks about weirdness. He said, Edgeware, my company, exists to validate weirdness. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? And it turns out weirdness is a particular kind of psychographic. Yeah. So the, the people that we often um, um, label as weird um, include creative artists, creative entrepreneurs, business people, um, creative activists, creative scientists, and criminals which is yeah. after all only you know sort of a you have to be really creative entrepreneurship but in each case with the possible exception of criminality these people bring novel value which um is is seen to have value into the world um and as such they are unusual my friend says they're about 10 percent of a given cohort um, which works for me. When I was a high school teacher at one stage, you'd have a class of 30 kids in front of you. There'd always be two, maybe three. Yeah. I suspect you would have been one of those. <laughs> Probably. You know, you would have, knowing you, you would have cruised through the academic stuff anyway. But um, these kids are often getting in trouble a lot, not because they have any, um, any deficit in academically or in any other ways. And often they, they're leader-type kids in, in mm. MBA. But they just can't stand bells. They can't stand uniforms. They can't yes. stand authority. They need to do things themselves. Yeah. Now, if you like that, and I am, I'm a weirdo, then you are underestimated routinely. You know, yes. you hear, you get feedback from the world, like get yourself a real job, get your head out of the clouds, get your feet on the yeah. ground, get yourself something you fall back on, yeah. which, which we interpret as the words to the effect of no. You know? yes. <laughs> so when we get together nobody likes being told no do they yeah. <laughs> because of course in our view what we have going for us our art or our science or our yeah. business idea or whatever is is the bee's needs you know and we can tend to overestimate ourselves yeah. in respect yeah. um why can't people see this value this yes. value and patently yeah. bringing into the world yeah. So we develop strategies in, right from childhood onwards that deal with what one might call underestimation. Mm. Mm. And is it a way of somehow fitting in enough that you'll be taken seriously without being constrained by, by that um, same... That's, that's, that's right. Depending on our, our individual makeup, I suppose. Mm. You know? I mean, part of that dem um, psychographic list of the weirdos... Um, includes a, a greater propensity to for to to mood disorders and mental illness mm -hmm. uh, a greater propensity to creativity or erratic behavior um, so it may be that we can sabotage ourselves mm -hmm. as well um, and uh, to the extent that we are socially fluent um, similarly we can disguise our weirdness sufficient to fit yeah. a particular niche yeah, but yeah. The, the great quit, the great resignation, the celebrated change, yeah. the shift that's going on right now, where depending on who you're, how you're doing the survey, a quarter of a given workforce is does not see themselves in the, the current job in 12 months' time. I think there is a crisis in meaning going on that has to do yes. with um, the failure of a purely industrial construction of what work is. And I think it's the elders who can actually help us help inform that process by yeah. virtue of the fact that they are reflecting, they have this metacognitive capacity to see the larger picture. 
Mm. And to help us make meaning of those um, those changes, um, I guess, because I, I think to some extent, and you know, I'm interested in what you think about this. As you said, we've 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 all grown up in this industrial uh, age where that idea of being productive and this very mechanised approach, but in the pre-industrial era, it wasn't the same. So, do you think that? Do you think we would have been considered weird before? Uh, you know. Taylor and Ford, or would this have always been been considered weird? The the you mean the the industrial construction of work? Yeah. Oh, worse more than weird. I think it's perverse. Yeah. I, I think it's aberrant. It's not true to our nature. Yeah. We're not actually yeah. built for this. So yeah. You know, yeah, that's right. So it's not actually us who are weird. It's the system that isn't built to um, to suit the way that people naturally are. This, um, this recent yeah. book, Humankind, you know, yeah. that, that's exactly yeah. that. that yeah. our, our default position is collaborative and yes. um, and compassionate. Um, this um, all for this centralized, focused, personalized, selfish gene is is um, an illness. Yeah. A special illness. Yeah. Yeah, so there's almost to this point where we've we've um, construed the system as such that uh, those who fit the system are seen as normal, even though that's not necessarily um, the natural way that you know evolutionarily we are meant to be. And we become prisoners of the paradigm, yeah. as we say. You know, the paradigm is the way we see the world, with the way we are in the world. Um, and the real risk, and again, this is something that the elders can help us with, or yes. elder budget can help us with, um, that can be, it's very difficult to interrupt, because, you know, like, like science itself, it, it works, you know, to an extent. Yes. Um, you can build factories, you can distribute. To an end. Factories to and to et cetera. An end. Yeah. But it is not, in the end, satisfactory. And we know yeah. that as we face obesity, depression, mood disorders, um, anorexia, these, these are conditions of meaninglessness, not of lack of resources, but a lack of meaning in life, a lack of compelling narratives to make sense of all of this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, creativity, I think, is really important to this, as you've already mentioned, that people you would put in this category of weirdness are people who have novel ideas, who have whether whatever field it might be, science, business, the arts, they've got creativity to to bring to the world. Um, so how do you nurture your creativity in your daily life? How have you made that a part of of what you do? Latterly, by latterly, I mean the last few years, I think there are um, skillful routines, I would call them. Um, some of those, and, and this is actually sort of groundwork for an eldragogic curriculum in the meantime. Um, how might one generate a curriculum if it's not about bells and English from yes. 730 and maths from 930 to 10, that sort of way of organising knowledge? Um, they have mainly to do with physical, mental, uh, sorry, mental and uh, psychological, even spiritual health in the first place. So in my case, it's meditation. Um, I, in, by myself and with a group and having a, a meditation teacher um, to simply, if for no other reason, that to help me see through the clutter, to unlearn, to, to go by the negative, to ditch what is not necessary. And in that process, reveal um, what was my purpose? What was the thing all along? Um, that should be accompanied by mental, by physical health, though. Um, yes. And I mentioned before we began that we have a new dog, a border yes. collie, which is very smart, very active. I yep. simply have no choice but to exercise regularly with this animal. Yep. So those two things regularly, and by regularly I mean every day, seven every days day. a week. Yep. Um, yep because the physical exercise gets the oxygen circulating it helps the mind body barrier dissolve a little bit um it's a little like um you know in the in the palazzo in, in venice where the, the the david is the michelangelo's david in the hallway outside the room where the david is housed there's a a series of um, unfinished sculptures called, sometimes called the slave series. They were originally going to line the 
the, the path to some pope's tomb or whatever, and it went on and off for decades, as many of Michelangelo's works did. Mm -hmm. um, and they're still very raw, you know, there's still this extraordinary, they're all slightly smaller than life-size male torsos, and you know, see these, they're fairly famous, you'll see these, this extraordinary sense of tension of these bodies um, pushing against the stone and Michelangelo famously claimed that he could see the form in the block before he picked up his tools now he did know he did need to know how to use those tools he did need to be oh, yeah. an expert a maestro yeah. with the tools but for him it was a process of extraction of removal you remove the clutter to reveal what is actually at heart and I think that's part of the wisdom of aging as well. You mm -hmm. care less about extraneous things. Yes. So if my quest, if my aim is to be happy, for example, I might make myself uh, rather a to, than a to-do list, a don't-do list um, of things that I need yeah. to remove yes. in order to reveal the happiness that is there all along. Mm. Um, so I think uh, those disciplines, um, yes. particularly meditation, but there are other practices, you know, it can be yoga, it can be a martial yeah. art, it can be athletics, you know, it doesn't yes. have to be fancy yes. or what, spiritual. Whatever you enjoy and therefore will do on a regular basis. Yeah. We talk about the flow state, we talk about a state where um, we are attuned to our own body and our environment, and I think if we can achieve that, the creativity bit just happens will flow yeah. yeah so looking after our bodies and our brains obviously because our brain is the living part of our and our social lives so as you say yeah. our connectivity with others yeah yeah that's really important um excellent that's great um so now you've talked a bit about how um part of the wisdom of elders is helping us make sense um and also to make meaning um, i mean i believe that making meaning is what makes us human you know it separates mm. us from other species mm. like you've talked about earlier so how do you uh when you look back over your professional life to this point um what's the sense or the meaning that you make from that and what brings you the greatest satisfaction in in what you've um, done so far i i heard just oh a year or so ago i think um i heard sort of indirectly from a woman who well she was a girl then she was a student of mine um but she's now a mum um and i heard that she she claims she she notices that her she said I can put my daughter's love of the arts down to the love of the arts that I got from you right yeah now that is magical for me because yeah. it shows that your influence in the world goes on independent of your presence in it yes um and I think that that notion and again it comes up in eldragogy and in elderhood and wisdom the notion of legacy the notion of having left the campsite a little bit better for your having been there if you find evidence of that then for me anyway for my kind of head um there's enormous satisfaction mm. in that this has been a life that an examined life well lived yes yes and do you think that your role as a as a teacher has played part in that or you know not just as formally when you taught in a school but you've been a teacher in many um ways um throughout your life um, Ab absolutely and and it, you can't divorce that from the personal journey as well like you know, again in the in the classics to to study the self is to forget the self to forget the self is to be actualized by the world so we begin by knowing ourselves very well, self-actualization in Maslow's terms or, or whatever, but with the view to be of service because the feedback from the world, and the, say, as in the anecdote I just shared, you know, yeah. is that um, that is worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It has absolutely nothing to do with the size of the car I drive, the size no, of the no. screen I'm looking at, you know, any of that material stuff. And we know that. We know that for a fact, and we will experience that ourselves, each one of us, on our deathbed will not be considering how much is in the bank you no. know, or what house we're living in we'll be considering who we love who has loved us and the difference we've made mm. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I recently um, had to get, I gave a speech and I talked about some of what I've learned across my career journey so far. And um, I, I spoke about three mentors I've had who've all since died. So they're people who are no longer with us, but you know, I share what I learned from them that is their legacy living on, you know, with others who they've not even met. So I think that, you know, the lessons we share or what people learn from us, even if we don't know they're learning it, um, is all part of the legacy we leave, isn't it? Uh, again, we, the psychologist, psychologized industrial human locates awareness, memory, consciousness in an organ between our ears. Um, there's a good argument for intelligence, memory, uh, value being stored beyond that organ um, in the through the interactions with others through the interactions with the environment itself so if we listen to ancient wisdom like Adi Miriam Rose's notion of dadiri or deep listening um, you sit in country and you listen deeply not just to what other human beings are telling you but what country in her terms is telling yes. you yes. Um, we we make we have an effect on the world by virtue of our exchanges and our interaction with the world. And that goes beyond the mere, merely psychological. Yes. Um, it's profoundly social, it's profoundly human, and it's engaged with place as well. Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so you mentioned earlier, and we've heard a lot about this concept of the great resignation or the big quit. And mm. as you've talked about, you know, people are dissatisfied with, I think, and COVID in many ways has brought this to a head in that people have had this time stuck in their homes to reflect on what they really want from life and they've decided that it's not what they currently have or not what they've done in the past. They're no longer willing to get in a train or a bus or traffic and spend two hours each way going to, to an office to just yeah. sit there and do something meaningless. So I think there's a lot of um, reflection going on at the moment. And I know you're doing some work in this space. Um, so what sort of advice do you have to those who might be considering some significant shift for themselves at, at the moment? It's, a, it's an interesting touch point actually between the boomers, my generation, and the millennials who are famously um, dissatisfied with conventional work for money, you know. I think there's a breakdown of that paradigm, that industrial paradigm of, you know, gathering things, materialistic and materialistic things and uh, a re-evaluation of narratives, of narratives that make the world meaningful. Now, if that's what's required, uh, a meaning-making exercise or alternative, more meaningful narratives, then it... it it's it, at Edgeware in, in my company, the first tool that we work with is a customer product differentiation tool. So leaving aside the idea of a business, let's just say you as an individual will yeah. bring something of value into the world just by being yourself. Yeah. Um, the, 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 so call that a product, you know, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you know that it has value? Well, there is a, a beneficiary. There's somebody who, there's an audience, there's somebody who will benefit from that value being in the world, call that a customer. Yes. You know? yeah. At the heart of every business is a value proposition, which is a relationship between the product and customer or the thing of value and the consumer of that thing of value. You know, So a good way to start is to actually ask those questions. You know, What, what, what are the things of value that I bring into the world? Um, and how do I know that those things have value? Well, there are people, um, networks, institutions that appreciate or benefit from that value. Um, and go from there. Once you have a value proposition in a business, you have everything else. You have your marketing yes. plan, you have your financial plan, and yes. etc. because it all revolves around that central relationship between the production and the consumption of value. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and importantly, I think around creating value, creating new value, not just extracting value from, you know, where it might uh, where yeah. it might it's, it's very close to your idea of worth in in this series you know discover yeah. your own worth your true worth yeah yeah um and yeah the way i see that is our true worth is when when we um are valued for our true worth or when when that's recognized then we're seen for who we are not just for what we do or what we or what yeah. we produce in that mechanized way 
Um, so how about for you, Michael, how do you embrace your own true worth? It's through others, increasingly through others. You know, I've been blessed to find personal relationships that are meaningful for me. Um, so I'm able to say, well, geez, even if I feel such and such about myself, she's seeing this in me. So there must be something there, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is evidence beyond my own little world that's trapped in my head. Um, that, that, that... So you, you put yourself out there, you know, uh, you find ways to make what's inside your head explicit in the world. Um, and you seek feedback on that. Um, and you act on that. Another trope that we use in Edgeware is action precedes clarity. Yes. So if I'm confused about the 16 things that I could be doing today, um, why not create a low risk um, experiment that puts out those the top four of those 16 things and see what the world says? You know, I mean, I'm undergoing a sort of experiment with LinkedIn at the moment along yep. the, exactly those lines where I'm stripping right back in order to make my algorithm um, yes. more receptive to where I actually want to be and sort of, you know, not trusting the algorithm, but observing no, no, no. what the algorithm, which is after all composed and, and always inputs changed. from a lot of other sources, sources yeah. other than me, including yeah. commercial ones. Yeah. Um, asking myself, well, and trying to notice, trying to properly notice. Yeah. I mean, what you said a minute ago, I think goes to the notion of authenticity. The, the the authentic self um, is this authentic is this um true yes yeah yeah exactly oh that's wonderful um this is a fantastic um conversation michael is there anything you want to add um that you'd love the audience to hear around um particularly around the the true wealth of our elders or you know some wisdom um from your own you know journey towards and into elderhood that you'd like to um, impart to us all? <laughs> well, there's a hundred things and you know, <laughs> yeah. Monique, I can talk under wet cement. Just, just <laughs> recently though, I'm, I'm very interested in this notion of the via negativa, by, by the negative, the, the, the stripping away of things mm -hmm. rather than the addition of things. So if I'm building curriculum, um, I might be as interested in, in unlearning as learning. Um, yes. Yeah. The assumption that we're, and, and actually this is advice that I, I do give people, you know, if you're, if you're concerned about what direction you should take, let's just imagine for a second that your destination is there already. That's not the problem. The problem is that you can't see it. Yes. Um, in order to see it, what do you need to get rid of? What people yeah. do you need to get rid of? What networks, what thought, what reading, what education do you need to get rid of? so that that can manifest your your direction your choice can manifest directly and that's often anecdotally what people will say you know i i spent 16 years trying to do blah yeah and one day ding there it was and i, I realized it was under my nose the whole time yeah you know yeah, yeah. so ask yourself what to get rid of create yes. a don't do list rather yeah. than a to do list yeah yeah fantastic thank you so much michael wonderful to um speak with you today and thank you all for listening in um if this conversation has sparked your interest i would love to invite you to join us in the true worth community where we um, share ideas insights and inspiration and you can find us at trueworth.mn.co thanks very much michael it's a real pleasure, as always.